Welcome to Hope Reformed Baptist Church. Amen. If you're new, we uh, would love to welcome you. I would love to welcome you. I'm Tom. I hope to speak with you afterwards. But for the time being, can you please open up your Bible? If you don't have one, you can grab one from the shelf outside or grab the person who looks friendly next to you. You can have theirs. Uh, if it's a Quran, throw it away. Get a Bible. Uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 13. Can you please open up to this book? We are going to be starting a Hebrew series uh, in a couple of weeks in the morning. Uh, there you go. All right. I'm glad you're, glad you're ready. Uh, and I think that this whole sermon series has really set our trajectory in going into Hebrews, relating Leviticus to the New Covenant, to the Gospel, and uh, by God's providence and grace, it has been helpful. We're going to be in Hebrews 13, and I want you to look at verse 20. This verse, this may well be one of the most read verses in uh, the Hope Reformed Baptist Church, because it's one of those favorite doxologies, or words of praise, or benedictions that are read by one of the, the men of God, the deacons, at the end of the uh, service. Here is the text of tonight, and then we will go into the theology, explanation, and good news of the text. Uh, the verse says this, right at the tail end of the whole book of Hebrews. So it'll be a couple of years maybe before we get to it in our series, so we're all right doing it right now. We'll be double the size by then, by God's grace. Here we are, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now, after all that I've said about Jesus in the book of Hebrews, now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And this is your part. Amen. Amen. May God bless this word to the glory of Jesus and to the fulfilling of his will in us tonight. Amen and amen. It is uh, my experience, and I'm sure you'll amen it, the average Christian has far too low a view or small a view of what salvation really is in its essence. And because of that fact, people, Christians, the average Christian will have far too high a fear and anguish and anxiety thinking about the question, do I have what it takes to get to the end? Have you ever struggled with this? Will I persevere? Will I be able to, with all the commands, with all the trials, temptations, and, 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 and whatnot in this world, will I be able to make it? Will, will, will I be able to get to the end of my life still pleasing God, still in, in covenant relationship with Him, so that I close my eyes in death, either in a tragic moment or at the end of a long life on a sickbed, when I close my eyes in death, will I open them to see my father and his gleaming smile looking down at me? Will, will I, will, do, I, do I have enough? That anxiety has, is in an inverse relationship. Nerds will love this language. That anxiety of final falling um, is in an inverse relationship to your view of the security of God's promises in the gospel. So as, as your view of the gospel and salvation diminishes, your anxiety will necessarily increase. But God has so ordained that as our view of salvation increases, our anxiety about ourselves, who don't really have much to do with this whole salvation thing anyway, diminishes. So tonight, though theological, deep, historical, I hope that this is what uh, the writer of Hebrews means for this to be, an encouragement that God will work His will in and through you by His gracious Spirit. So, we want to extend and expand our view of salvation tonight, heighten our sense of security in God's preserving grace. Look at uh, verse 20. Uh, no surprise that this is in our blood series, or, or no question as to why this is our text tonight. Right there in verse 20, towards the end, it says, by, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Here you go. That's our series, the blood of Jesus Christ. <coughs> but then it says here, by the blood of... And it doesn't say Jesus, does it? It doesn't say the blood of Christ, like many of our other verses have said. This says the blood, and we know what blood that is, the blood, the blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus, obviously. But it says the blood of the eternal covenant. So, so what's the eternal covenant? And probably you'd, you'd be a good Christian, you'd be a good Reformed Baptist, 16 and Christian, you know, hope Christian, you go, it's the, it's the gospel. It's the covenant between God and man. He makes promises. And, and it's, a, it's the covenant based on Jesus' blood. And, and, and it's the eternal covenant. Well, because it never runs out, does it? And I mean, everybody that has ever been saved has been saved by this, by this covenant. It's the gospel, the good news of promises made from God to man. That's the eternal covenant. And I love you, but 
That was a great answer, but you're wrong. All of you, every one of you that just thought that, you're wrong. And uh, I'll show you why. Because, good try, good try. Have another, have another go uh, next time I ask for answers. Because the eternal covenant that's being referred to here is not actually the covenant between God and man that we call sometimes the covenant of grace, or in other words, the, the new covenant sometimes we'll call, or, or salvation, the gospel. It's not a covenant made between God and man through Jesus and the gospel. This is actually the eternal covenant, the timeless covenant, the pre-time covenant. If you want to be a nerd tonight, the pre-temporal, because temporary means time, pre-temporal. Before time, there was a covenant, and it wasn't between God and man, because man wasn't around, neither was woman. It was between God and who else was around before time. It was just got very good. You got that answer right. I'm proud of we're learning. We were, it, this is a covenant. This eternal covenant is referring to a covenant not made between God and man, the gospel, but between God's intrapersonal, tr uh, Trinitarian, distinct, eternal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the eternal covenant that we're actually looking into and discovering tonight. There is deeper promises, in other words, that you'll, this will blow your mind. There are actually deeper promises than the promises of the gospel. There are more amazing promises than the promises God makes to sinners through Jesus. There are more uh, definitive, ultimate, glorious, effective, influential promises than God makes to us through the pages of Scripture in and through the blood of His Son in Jesus. And those are the promises that God the Father makes to God the Son in God the Holy Spirit and promises that God the Son makes back towards God the Father in God the Holy Spirit. So before God ever made promises to you and me, God made promises to himself, by himself, through himself, in himself. And that prehistory, pre-time, eternal covenant is the basis of, of the historical covenants that we know as good uh, Reformed theologians, the covenant of works, the covenant of, of Abraham and Israel and David and, and, and the covenant of Jesus, the new covenant, the salvation covenant of, of the gospel. That eternal covenant is the ground or the, the foundation of the temporal or the historical salvation and covenants that God makes. This is, we'll call it this, a covenant between members of the Trinity that they would, what are they covenanting to do? That they would, in their perfect unity, yet according to individual roles, right? the Father does one thing, the Spirit does another, the Son does it. The Father doesn't die on the cross, for example. The Father was not born into a human nature. Uh, uh, the Son did that. The Son did not fall at Pentecost. The Spirit did that. So according to their own distinct individual roles, the Trinity agreed that they would, in their perfect unity, achieve salvation for fallen man even though man didn't exist to be fallen yet. That's why Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's why this is the eternal gospel that is proclaimed in Revelation by the angels. Why? Because, because even before we existed to fall in Adam, God had already a plan of salvation for us. This is the eternal grounds of our salvation. Or, uh, uh, we call this in theological uh, schools, uh, we call this the covenant of redemption. Or if you're a nerd, again, I'm really throwing some out for the nerds tonight. You want Latin? I'll give you this. The pactum salutis. The pactum meaning a pact, a covenant, Latin for covenant. And salutis is, is Latin for salvation. So the covenant of redemption or pactum salutis is the grounds of our salvation, of the gospel to come later, and is what is referring to here by the blood of the eternal covenant. Now, some actually deny the, the existence of this covenant. Some people don't believe in that. Some people question it at least and say it's hazy, but I want to help uh, establish it from Scripture so that we can see this as not just a really cool, tight, polished up piece of Reformed theology that sort of birthed out of the confessions and, and perfected by Charles Spurgeon and dressed up in the 1689. We don't want to do that. We want to see it in Scripture itself. Now, here's Here's not the problem, but, but maybe a beginning of a potential problem is that we can't go to Hebrews chapter 14 verse 1 on a chapter called the covenant of redemption. We don't get the, the, the you know, the, 
Genesis starts at creation. It doesn't, there's no Genesis negative one chapter which tells us everything God did before he created the world. But there is, isn't there, in Scripture, plenty of verses that talk about what God was doing or did before the foundations of the world were laid by him in his infinite wisdom. These are the language of decrees. God was planning, not devising a plan, trying to think something up, but decreeing by, by mean he was establishing what the future would be. He was electing who would be saved. He was foreordaining all that would come to pass. This is what God was doing. We do have those portions in Scripture. We have uh, other examples in Scripture of the Son relating to the Father in such a way that we can see a previous uh, agreement had been established. This if you, then I language. Or since you, then I will language. So we can see this in Scripture by, by doing, simply by doing theology. This is the basic, basic discipline of doing theology. is not just taking each word of the text as it stands and, and then not relating them to each other, but by taking the whole of Scripture and picking up all the, the particular truths about a certain idea that are sprinkled over the whole and bringing them together so that we can crystallize and categorize different ideas of thought. And that's what we do with the covenant of redemption. Here's some basic questions. Do we see a decreed salvation plan in the Bible involving all the members of the Trinity? We all said yes. Big hint, all the answers to this are yes. <clears throat> yes, there was a pre-time decree of salvation that would involve the Trinity. And then, do we see a kind of interpersonal relation in that decree where the Father, the Son, and the Spirit do not all do the same roles? Yes, good job. Do we see a kind of language in Jesus' earthly life and the prophecies made about him that suggests that the God the Son is depending on and relying on and trusting in specific, specific promises made by the Father on condition, act, on condition of acts of obedience of Jesus in life? Yes, we do. We see language in Jesus' life and in the prophets and in the Psalms of, uh, if you, then I. Lord, if I do this, then you will do this, as you promised you would do. If I did this, so I've done it, now I wait for your blessing. We see that language. Was such an agreement and a decree, these conditional promises between father and son, were they made in time or before time? Before, the answer to that one wasn't yes. I'm sorry, I've thrown everybody off. Uh, before time, yes. So therefore, we have all the elements of what is called the covenant of redemption right there. We simply connect them all together and we have the factum salutis. Can you turn with me to John chapter 17? John chapter 17, I, I hear the, the groans of excitement among some of you who know what John 17 is. John 17 is, is the climax of, of the whole evening that Jesus spent with his disciples before he was betrayed and killed. And he tells them about the Trinitarian plan of salvation and, and prayer. And if you ask of anything, I will answer it. And in fact, not only I will answer it, but the Father will answer it because he loves you. And great joy will come through great sorrow and mourning. And I'm going to be taken away, but, but take great heart. You'll have a, a comfort and joy in this world. I've overcome the world. These are uh, uh, John chapter 12 is the last supper. 13, 14, 15, 16 is Jesus' last sermon to his disciples before he will die. And in John 17... He turns from his disciples to his father to pray for his disciples. If you've got an ESV, it'll say, it'll have a little subheading there, added later, not inspired, but true still. It might be titled, Jesus' Great High Priestly Prayer. Because what Jesus is doing right now, as we've talked so many times throughout this blood series, Jesus is enacting, not acting, but truly enacting in his role as the great high priest over not merely blood Israel, but the spiritual Israel, all those that God has given to him to save. And so he's in the presence of the Father, praying just before he makes his own bloody sacrifice on the cross. He prays over the people that the Father has given to him, just as the old high priest used to pray over the nation that God has given to him to shepherd. So look at what Jesus says, and we're, we're going <coughs> to... Pick this apart sentence by sentence to really prove the fact that there was a pre-time agreement between father and son that was conditional, that would arrive at salvation for a chosen people. John chapter 17, verse 1. 
When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father. Now, already we can stop there and prove and see. Uh, I don't want to go too far. I mean, we, we would just glance over that, I'm sure. We would read the whole thing. But even right then, God the Son is, respond, is re- reacting, might be the wrong word, relating to the other member of the Trinity as Father. So this is intra, intra-Trinitarian personal relations about whatever they're about to talk about. So, so that's already established. The Son is relating to God the Father as Father. And he says, Father, the hour has come. For, just pause there. The hour has come. So even in that phrase, we get the, the understanding. There is a definite plan that would culminate at a particular moment in time down to the nanosecond by the decree of God. So there's such a thing as the hour, the time, the moment which assumes such a thing as a plan. You don't get to a certain point in the plan or the end of the plan unless there's a plan. I sound like a politician right now, don't I? There's a 40-step plan. We're going to get to step number 40 because there is such a plan that is 40 steps for, for your salvation. Um, <clears throat> so, so there is an hour, and it's not just a plan that is going... It's a plan that is coming to fulfillment in space-time history because the hour planned has now come in history. So, so there's a decree, there's a purposed, eternal plan of redemption, and it has now come. A moment in time planned from before time. And Jesus says, glorify your son. So, so he's not just speaking merely as human. Of course he's speaking as human. But, but he's relating to God as father to divine son. Because he's about to talk about, when I was with you before the foundations of the world, well, well, he wasn't human back then. This is one of those rare moments that we're we're hearing the human voice of Jesus voice the divine person's thoughts. Father, I was with you. Didn't have these vocal cords. I didn't have this body. I wasn't Jesus of Nazareth then. Not in reality. I was your son. And I'm praying to you now, though human, as your son. Not merely as, as a perfect human Example. In other words, no one else other than Jesus could ever pray this prayer. This is not uh, what any good Israelite or any good Christian could. This is only Jesus' prayer because only he is eternal son. So anyway, the son is praying to his eternal father, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. This is the understanding that there's back and forth reliance upon promises and conditions that the Father is saying to the Son, if you do this, I'll glorify you. And the Son is saying to the Father, if I do this, you will glorify me so that I can glorify you. There is, there is a way to make it sound too human and too, too much like bartering. I don't want to do that, but I'm trying to make it clear for us that there was an understanding of agreement before time, but beforehand. Uh, look at verse 2. Jesus says, since, I'm asking for glory, since... You have given him authority authority over all flesh. Okay, so, so the father had given or allocated authority to the son for a previously designated purpose. You, 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 I was with you. You gave me authority over flesh. So in time history for a purpose. Since you did that, therefore glorify me. Verse 2 goes on. You have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all. So that tells us the subject or the object really of of this whole agreement that he's talking about from before time is that it has to do with salvation. The prior agreement with back and forth conditions between the father and the son made before time about what would happen in time was pertaining to salvation. So Jesus says, this is all about eternal life. And then he says, so that I, uh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So the people who would receive eternal life in Jesus' own mindset are the people who are given to him by the Father as a reward chosen before time. So there is an agreement, therefore, in these simple two verses we can establish, there is an agreement between the Father and the Son made before time about how salvation would be accomplished in time And there are back and forth conditions placed upon them both for the sake of mutual glorification. This is called the covenant of redemption. Or go with me to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. 
Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 is really, there's a bit, it's all back to the future kind of stuff. We've got the writer of the Hebrews quoting an Old Testament passage that prophesied Jesus coming into the world and quoting that passage and quoting other passages about something that happened before time. So you got the writer of the Hebrews telling us what the prophets said Jesus would do as he quoted other prophets about what would happen before what had happened before time. So super simple. If you get lost here, there's no hope for you. Uh, it's, it's so simple, straightforward. Look at what verse 5 says. The writer of the Hebrews says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, now the previous verse is, it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats takes away any sin. In other words, that, that just pulls the rug out of the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament. So what's the point of the whole Old Testament? Let's be like Marcion and modern day fools and jesters who call themselves preachers and say, let's unhitch the Old Testament. It's obviously irrelevant. It did nothing. Well, well if the blood of bulls and goats takes away no sin, why keep the front chunky stuff? that scares the kids in Sunday school. Why keep it? Because it told us the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin, and it prophesied that Jesus, the Christ, who could take away sin. So bloods and bulls and, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Consequently, therefore, oh, did you, would you believe God knew the Old Testament couldn't save anybody? He, he, he was ahead of us on that one. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, and now he quotes Old Testament. This is Because animal blood can't take away sin, because that's true, Jesus came into the world and then reads the Old Testament scrolls and says to God, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Eternally pleasing they are not. But, the body and the blood of bulls and goats have not pleased you. You have not eternally desired them, Lord God. But a body you have prepared for me, the perfect son of God in human flesh. Blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But you have sent me in a body prepared. There's, there's the language again. Prepared. Already planned. The body is here. This was not a, a, a genius idea of God on the moment of Christmas. Oh, they're already going to have a holiday called Christmas. Let's make it relevant to salvation. No, this was pre-planned. Jesus came into the world. Since the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, Jesus came in and said, well, I've got blood that God, in a, in a body that God prepared for me. Lord, Lord, in burnt offerings, this is what Jesus said, maybe not verbally, but probably verbally. But he said this to the Father, in burnt offerings and sin offerings, you've taken no pleasure. No eternal justice has been satisfied by burnt offerings and sin offerings. They had a purpose. It wasn't eternal salvation. It wasn't pleasing God entirely. Then I said, now Jesus is quoting the prophecy that quotes him as quoting another prophecy. <laughs> All right. Then I said... Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So Jesus comes and says, God, I read the book. I know the teaching of Leviticus, and I know the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But here I am, your son, in a body you've prepared for me. Now, those sacrifices don't satisfy, but I read the other scroll that says, I have come to do your will. What will? The will of the eternal covenant where Jesus received his marching orders from his father before time. According to the Old Testament, which can't save, there will come later a salvation which can save because the one who comes can have blood that takes away sin because he fulfills the will of the father who wrote it all and spoke it all. So Jesus uh, Hebrews uses the Old Testament to prove that Jesus had an agreement before the foundation of the world. There's an insufficiency of sacrifices. There's a satisfying sacrifice in Jesus. Right? You've prepared a body for me. Behold, I have come. There's also an agreement to the Father. I've come to do your will. And lastly, 
All of this was prophesied. Jesus himself says, quoting the Old Testament, which was prophesying him saying this. It's a big loop. (laughs) And Jesus says, as it was written. So Jesus was prophesied by the Old Testament as coming to fulfill a pre-temporal command of God because flesh and blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. The Father and the Son, in the Spirit, covenanted to each other that they would each fulfill conditions to one another in time for the sake of salvation of lost humanity. That's our point. That's the covenant of redemption. There are other verses that show us this, that give us inklings or sort of hints into Jesus' own thought life as to how he was relating to the Father and what things he was thinking as he did his, his acts of ministry. Uh, for example, I don't expect you to go to all of these. You may want to write them down. Uh, John 6, 38, Jesus says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So he's not just saying here, I've come down to do the law. No, he says that other places. Here he's saying, I have come down to do my father's will, which is not codexed in the law, but in the covenant before he sent me. That's why I came down. So I've come down to fulfill my father's will in all things, which will include the law, but be more than the law. Isaiah 42 verse 1 says, Of God prophesying his Messiah, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. You get the, this is my son in whom I am well pleased vibes there, don't you? This is my chosen servant in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. An anointed, appointed savior for the nations. Isaiah 53 verse 10 has this similar language where the father says, uh, it's, it's, it's spoken of the father and son relationship. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. Do you see that, that back and forth uh, promise made, Jesus fulfills, therefore a blessing is earned language? He will suffer according to my will, because it's my will to crush him. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will bless him with the division of many souls, because he poured his soul out to death, Isaiah 53, 12. We need to realize that Jesus' life was lived before the Father, earning rewards. It was not a grace-based relationship. It was a law-based relationship. If you have a problem with that, it's probably because you have a defunct view of the law and you think law means angry. No, law is God's heart requirements. Jesus lived without any grace because he didn't need grace. He was perfect. The Father's delight was in him. He earned the Father's delight by nature of being the Son and by nature of being a perfect human. Jesus lived under the divine scrutiny of God and never had reason to fear it or come under his judgment because he was perfect. (coughs) Therefore, God blessed him with the promises of salvation that he could bless us with. Psalm 16, verse 10. This is prophesying the voice of the Messiah. I'm not not finding this connection. This is literally in the apostles' sermons all throughout the book of Acts. They, They quote this one as being about Jesus. Psalm 16, verse 10 is prophesying what Jesus will say, which is this. You, God, will not abandon my soul to the grave, or let my whole, you will not let your Holy One, the word is Christ, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. There's a, there's a leaning on God the Father's promise when the Son comes into the world in a human body, he will not fear going to death because he leans on Psalm 16, verse 10, which says that he, even if I die, I'll go into the grave, I won't be there long enough to corrode and corrupt and rot because I'm the Holy One. And he will not let the Holy One see corruption. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, that's not about David because his body rotted. All the Jews thought that was about David, the Holy One of God. It's not about David because his body rotted and Peter's very sacrimonious uh, 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 proof of this was, let's go dig up David. As proof that this isn't about David. His body's corroded. His his coffin still holds in it the dust of his bones. But not Jesus. So Acts 17 verse 31 says, God has fixed a day. There's another language. There is a P 
pinpointed day that gets closer every 24 hours. God has fixed a day on which he will judge the whole world in righteousness through a man. A man whom he has appointed. Another language of divine planning of certain details in salvation. And of this he has assurance to, has given assurance to everybody by raising that guy from the dead. Oh, who's going to be the judge of all? Who could be God's favorite judge and most discerning, wise counsel to determine who gets to go to heaven or hell? Who could that be? My vote's going to be the only one he ever rose from the dead. I think he has God's pleasure and his uh, affirmation and his approval to decide who gets to go to heaven or hell. That, that's the divine logic. And that is what Acts 17, Paul tells us. So the Father then, we see in all these Old Testament, New Testament passages, the Father had made promises to his Son on condition of obedience. The Son has pleased the Father by obeying all that he was commanded in his life and in his death and has earned salvation for sinners. Or in the language of Philippians 2, therefore God has raised him up and given him a name that is above every name. His obedience earns the reward. Jesus has no reward to give to us. Jesus has no reward in his rule and reign. Jesus has no glory that was not in every detail earned. He earned it all by fulfilling the Father's will. So the covenant of redemption is the eternal foundation for our historic salvation. Why is there salvation in time? Because God planned triunally to commit to save sinners in time before time. Why is there a perfect, indestructible salvation that never passes away or corrodes with the ages? Because before you and I had anything to do with it, the God who can't lie made vows to himself. Why will God not fail to equip you with anything you need? Because he promised his son before time that he would equip you with everything you need. Now, some of you are asking the question, there's a third one. You miss, there's the, we have a trinity. What about the spirit? Maybe you've got a charismatic background. Maybe you're just a good theologian. Maybe you're reading John. And you, hey, there's, a, there's another one here. Father, Son, they made the agreement. We should not neglect the spirit. I say, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Spirit. Where is the spirit in this agreement? And I don't know the, the language they used uh, of course, the Spirit was in perfect unity in the devising of this plan before time. But where is the Spirit partaking in this in time? The Father and the Son made covenants and promises to each other, the covenant of redemption. They made those promises and vows in the Spirit. That is, the Spirit is the realm, or the Spirit is, uh, is the agency through which the Father fulfills his promises to the Son, and through which the Son fulfills his promises to the Father. So they don't make additional promises with the Spirit. The Father and the Son have these covenant vows to each other, and the Father makes them in the relation of the Spirit in love, and then upholds them by the agency of the Spirit in time. And the Son makes these promises back to the Father before time, in the relationship of the Spirit, which is love, and then he fulfills them and renders his obedience back to the Father in and through and by the power of the Holy Spirit in time. So, John 3, verse 34, this is the whole reason Jesus is, you know, the whole language of the Bible about being the anointed one, the Christ, is because he would be the one with the Spirit. That's what anointed really pointed to. The Father rendered all of his blessings to Jesus through the Spirit. That's why John 3, 34, Jesus says, for the Father gives the Spirit to me without measure. And Christ renders his side of the agreement back to the Father in and through the Spirit. And so in Hebrews 9, 14, for example, we read, Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. So that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Not, not that there's a third level of promises, although he's involved, but he proceeds from the Father and the Son in a different, different way than the Son is begotten by the Father. Uh, the Father and the Son have the covenant in the communion of love of the Holy Spirit and then render their obedience or, or fulfillment to each other through the Spirit. Some of you 
I just heard you asked for, you asked for a second London Baptist confession quote. All right, I got it. Uh, if you wanted it, we're in chapter 8, LBC chapter 8, and section 1 says this. It pleased God, and this, they're doing way better than what I just took 30 minutes to do. They're just going to summarize all of this teaching beautifully, poetically, theologically, and they don't need half an hour of your time. Nonetheless, this is what they say. It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son, according to the covenant made between them both, covenant of redemption, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, the priest, the king, the head and savior of the church, the heir of all things and the judge of the world, unto whom God did from all eternity give a people to be his offspring and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. So in other words, what, what is this whole blood series been? It's been a study of the rewards Jesus earned by his obedience, which he then in the gospel grants to all who believe. That's what this has been. Spurgeon wrote a, uh, he, he took poetic license, as I think preachers are allowed to do. Uh, that's, I think, you know. Uh, the Bible says I'm allowed to do it, I think, you know, poetic license anyway. Uh, but he took some poetic license and sort of thought, this is not what was said, but this is, this is what we could imagine the kind of thing being said. So he's not, he's not ascribing language to God that God has not said. This is not scripture. This is his, his helping us to picture the conversation that we've been talking about. It is as if the Father said, I, the Most High Jehovah, do hereby give unto my only begotten and well-beloved Son, a people, countless beyond the number of the stars, who shall by him be washed from sin, amen, preserved, kept, led, and by him at the last presented before my throne without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I covenant by my oath and swear by myself because I can swear by no greater that these whom I now give to my son shall be forever the objects of my eternal love. Them I will forgive through the merits of his blood. To these will I give an eternal righteousness. These I will adopt and make my sons and daughters. And these shall reign with me, with Christ, through eternity. The Holy Spirit, Spurgeon imagined, says, I hereby covenant that all whom the Father has given to the Son, I will in due time regenerate. I will show them their need of redemption. I will cut off from them all groundless hope and destroy their refuge of lies. I will bring them to the, blood of, to the blood of sprinkling. I will give them faith whereby this blood shall then be applied to them. I will work in them every grace and I will keep their faith alive and I will cleanse them and drive out all depravity from them eventually and they shall be presented at last spotless and faultless. The son says, my father, on my part, I covenant that in the fullness of time, I will become man. I will take upon myself the form and nature of that fallen race. I will live in their wretched world. And for my people, I will keep the law perfectly. I will work out a spotless righteousness, which shall be acceptable to the demands of your just and holy law. In due time, I will then bear the sins of all my people. You shall thou exact their debts on me. All of their chastisements for sin I will endure. And the stripes, by my stripes they shall be healed. My Father, I hereby covenant and promise that I will be obedient unto death, even death on the cross. I will magnify thy law and make it honorable. I will suffer all they ought to have suffered. I will endure the curse of thy law, and all the vials of thy wrath shall be emptied and spent upon my head. I will then, according to your promise, rise again. I will ascend into heaven. I will, ascend, I will intercede for them at thy right hand, and I will make myself responsible for every last one of them. Who's ultimately responsible for your salvation? It's not you. It's the God-man in the presence of his Father. Not that, so that not one of them you have given me will ever be lost. 
But I will bring all my sheep of whom by my blood thou hast constituted me the shepherd. I will bring every one safe to thee at last. I can't say it better than that. That's the eternal covenant. So now look back after our introduction. Look into Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Uh, the, if you're regular here, you know I'm not joking. Hebrews 13, verse 20, to, to close out these, these ideas. If this is behind the text, shining through the text like a stained glass window at midday right into our eyes, if that's what's behind the text, let, let's see it in there. Verse, uh, Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace, that is the Father, the Father who made covenant vows to his Son on conditions of obedience, may he who brought again the de from the dead our Lord Jesus. So may God the Father who made vows to his Son and then kept them because his Son's alive and did not see corruption. May that Father who rose our Lord Jesus who also made vows and kept them. May our May the Father of our Lord Jesus, who rose our Lord Jesus after he kept all of his vows to his Father, who is now rightly and by his earnings the head, the king, the savior, the prophet, priest, and king, the shepherd of the sheep, in other words. May the Father who made and kept vows and therefore rose our Lord Jesus, who made and kept eternal vows, who is thereby the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant. By the blood, is it not an amazing thing that the eternal covenant made in spirit before time or even matter had existence before any blood actually existed? They so covenanted that this would be our salvation, that the sign and seal and emblem and stamping of this covenant being fulfilled would be Jesus' human blood. The eternal covenant was sealed, ratified, certified, and established in the blood of Calvary. That blood of Jesus is the proof and emblem of this covenant between God and God. Between Father and Son. So may that God of that Lord Jesus, the shepherd, who did that, may he... And then, and then what does this verse see as our doing? May he do something in us. May he, now verse 21 shows our side of this. May he make you equipped with everything good so that you can do his will. Working in us what is pleasing in his sight. So we have two things that you and I, on the back of all of this, are, are to be seeing as doing. This is, this is the expectation of the writer of Hebrews. Since all of that is true, here's what it looks like for you. You walk in God's will. You do his will and you work th that which is pleasing in God's sight. You don't continue in your sin and make silly, silly claims of being under God's grace and blood. I don't have to worry about my sin, I'm under blood. We don't, we don't walk away from God's law thinking that it's evil, that it's hard, that it's old-fashioned, that it's old covenant. We don't walk away from God as if he's the angry one. I have to find my way to please him. He has been pleased in his son eternally according to the covenant, and the blood is proof of that. What are we to do? Do his will and do what is pleasing in his sight. However, the grammar of the verse tells us that while you will do his will and you will do what is pleasing to God, it's God that is equipping you to do his will. It's God who rose Jesus from the dead who is equipping you to be pleasing in his sight. We strive in obedience and in pleasing and in walking to do his will. Every step of the way, relying by faith, walking by faith, that the strength to land the next foot on the ground, the strength to divert from the next thorny lash of sin, the, the, the spiritual discernment to not grab onto the head, the, the head of, the, of the adder, which will, which will sinfully wrap around us and strike us. The, everything that we need to do his will, we rely on by faith, he will provide for us. Which means that the first and most important step of your sanctification is realizing that even your own everything
everyday obedience. Maybe for some of us, it's just getting up on time tomorrow. You know, sleeping's in a sin, right? If some of you need to be somewhere, and I'm just choosing the lowest hanging fruit. If, if the thing you're worried about is Monday, will I be able to get up and face, not even face things, be awake without hitting snooze 10 times and calling in sick? Will I even have that? I'm just trying to make this, this is on the ground, everyday actual obedience. The most important thing you need to realize before you enact any obedience is that the reality or the fact of the obedience, which you will do, is not ultimately because you strove and made effort. It's partly that. It's not ultimately because Jesus promised you that he'll help you, though he did that. You're making progress in sanctification, avoiding sin and walking in God's law, is ultimately an assured fact because God the Father promised his son before time that if he give his head to be bruised for you and die and be buried, then he will raise him and give to him a people that will be equipped to do his will. Your sanctification bears fruit in our changed life and doing his will and what is pleasing, but the grounds of it is that the Father promised the Son before time that you would be sanctified. Psalm 110 verse 3 says, your people will offer themselves to you freely on the day of your power. Ephesians 5 verse 25 says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. That was part of his condition to the Father. I will give my life if by my life and blood you sanctify the people I'm dying for, my bride. He gave his life. He died. The Father rose him. The blood of the eternal covenant is therefore the sign and emblem that God will sanctify you and me in our everyday acts of obedience and saying no to sin. Our equipment to do his will is a part of God's eternal covenant, not even to you, but to himself. So what is before you? What trial and what temptation? What calling has God put upon you? What difficult decision and bad news do you need to break? What hard conversation do you need to have? What apology do you need to make or confession of sin? What difficult ministry? What family with trials or, or starting a family or making it through the difficulty of that or, or just having the energy to faithfully undertake your tasks towards your household week in, week out? What challenges before you? What infirmities has God sent upon your life, maybe bodily, maybe mental? None of them stand beyond or outside of what God has promised himself he will equip you to be able to deal with. One of the most amazing things is that if you have not yet believed in Jesus and you do believe in Jesus, we, we learn that even that believing was a part of what the Father promised in the Holy Spirit he would do in you so that he could render you holy by faith and give to Jesus his son. Some of you right now are unconverted, but you are future gifts of the father to the son. But before, I don't want to give any false sense of security that you can sit back and just wait and God will convert you. I'm going to do what the writer of the Hebrews does and say, flee from the wrath to come. If such an amazing salvation has been presented before you tonight, and I pray faithfully, then your response must be, to place your faith in Jesus Christ and flee from all wrath and be found in him for the righteousness of Jesus Christ, forgiveness and adoption into God's eternal family. Do that now. That is your responsibility. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. It's so humbling in this moment to be so acute aware of the fact that I have never preached a worthy sermon of this gospel. None of us have ever had worthy thoughts of this salvation. And every single one of us, and whatever thanks we are now to offer up to you in song and to praise and, and in prayer, not a single syllable of that praise is worthy of what you deserve. It, it falls so far short. Given a trillion Years in the glory to come, we will be no closer to finishing how much glory and praise you deserve than we are right now. 
Lord God, we, we, we humbly acknowledge that. And yet, in the voices that you've given us, in the mouths and in the minds and in the bodies that you've given to us, we say we can never fully fulfill your will, but we will faithfully, by your Holy Spirit, render faith to Jesus Christ who makes these promises. We will lean on you, God, to fulfill in us exactly what it is that you have prepared beforehand for us to walk in. We will trust that by the Holy Spirit, we will be able this week to say no to sins we have tolerated too long. And we will be enabled to walk in righteousness that we have previously thought impossible. We rely upon you, God, and ask that you would fulfill these things in us. For such is the power of the blood of Jesus of the eternal covenant. And so, Lord God, on his merits and on his blood and on his righteousness, we plead and pray, even in our own hearts in this moment, communally, we pray for those in our midst who are unsaved. We ask that you would give to them now salvation, right in this moment, a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit would break all of their ridiculous hopes to, to, to get to heaven themselves or to flee from you on judgment day. Point their eyes to Jesus on the cross, now in heaven, enthroned forevermore, never to die again, and give them faith that trusts in him alone. We praise you, God, for all of your mighty, marvelous grace in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And everybody who believed these things said...